Okay, good evening everybody. My name is Candace Pilgrim and I'm one of the founders of MWM along with Michelle and Chat. So hopefully you guys have gotten to know us over the last few weeks with our live videos and other interactions in the Facebook group. But we wanted to take a second just to thank you guys for being active in the group and making this group become everything we wanted it to be. There's been some awesome discussions and content already. So that's, that's what we wanted. And we've been pleasantly surprised how fast the group has really grown. And we know it'll cont continue to be a success. So thank you guys for that. This is our first Zoom call, so bear with us. Um, I've only done Zoom a few other times, but I've never hosted a meeting. I've done other meetings, but uh, bear with me on that. If, it may not be perfect, but we'll improve each month. So I'd like to introduce our first guest, Anna Kelly. She is one of our very own members, so we're excited to have her with us tonight to speak on lessons that she's learned in her journey. So Anna is the founding partner of Zenith Capital Group, Apex Multifamily, and REIMom.com. She's been investing for 20 years in real estate. Wow, that's a ton of experience, Anna. She owns and manages over 16 million in real estate, and she's also a limited partner in over a thousand doors. So she's been building her multifamily portfolio all while raising four active children. So I know for me at least that's super impressive because I only have one, and one is hard enough while trying to grow a business. So that's awesome. But I'll let Anna tell a little bit more about herself whenever she starts speaking on her journey. If you have any questions for Anna while she's talking, if you'll just enter them into the chat box, then once we're done, I'll go through and unmute each person to ask questions. I felt like that would be better than us all like trying to talk over each other and interrupting Anna. So if you'll just enter your questions, then we'll get them at the end. So with that being said, Anna, I'll go ahead and let you take over from here. And we're excited to learn more about your journey and the lessons you've learned. Sure. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here and I'm glad that you ladies started this group for uh, the rare breed that we are as women in multifamily and hope that I can just um, encourage y'all today through my journey. And, um, you know, we, I don't know how long all of you have been involved in multifamily or real estate in general, um, but it, it looks really good on Facebook and when you're looking at people's success, but the reality is there's a lot of hard work and ups and downs and challenges that um, take us a lot of times longer than we think it's going to take us. And um, it's, it's really a long journey and just really sticking with it. And so I hope that a little bit of my journey and some of the challenges and the lessons that I've learned will help you no matter where you are in real estate, just to um, continue pushing forward and, and growing. So before I start, if you girls would just mind sending me a quick chat and just telling me like how long you've been involved in multifamily or we can even open it up. I'm just kind of curious, like how many years each of you've been investing. So I see a year for some of you ladies, three months. Awesome. Does it uh, include a uh, single family? <laughs> <laughs> Any real estate investing, yes. Um, okay. Okay, so. I won't take too long. I just want to see if I can see your chats. Wonderful. I see some are brand new, starting a couple five years, two years, three years, two years, ten years. Awesome. Great. So that gives me a little bit of a, a good flavor of a, of a mix of what y'all have done. And just a little bit more about me, as Candace said, I've been investing on and off in real estate in some way, shape or form in 20 years. But in the beginning, it was really dabbling like a lot of different people. You know, I knew um, that real estate was powerful and that the, the clients that I had that were really wealthy when I started out in private banking, my corporate career, um, all had real estate and I knew that one day I wanted some if I could ever figure out how to get enough money to start investing. And so um, I've dabbled for about 20 years and I started out um, really just buying my uh, first rental property, my first property as a house hack. So instead of, you know, having an apartment building, I bought a condo. And when I got married, instead of renting, we, you know, bought a house in a 
kind of rough up and coming area thinking that it was going to go up in value really fast and we were going to make all this money and that didn't quite happen. Um, and then I started flipping. I did my first flip uh, 16 years ago in Houston, Texas before I moved to Pennsylvania. And so I, I've done everything from really small rentals to flips, vacation rentals, some Airbnbs, um, single family houses, small multifamily units. And now I'm really targeting larger multifamily. So just a little bit, um, I've, I've had a couple of businesses related to real estate. Um, Hershey area rentals are my small rentals in Hershey, Pennsylvania, where I live. Um, I started a company called Mom Buys Houses LLC and blanketed my area with postcards and drove my little minivan with my Mom Buys Houses <laughs> magnetic uh, sign on the side of my car and um, really did pretty well just marketing as a woman um, in flipping houses and buying rentals in my small area um, where it actually helped me to be a woman because people wanted to do business with me um, as a mom that was trying to make it in real estate. And then I started REI Mom LLC, which is um, my entity that I do some speaking and coaching through. And um, then in the last year, I started Zenith Capital Investments for my multifamily investments. And I recently partnered with one of my JV partners that we've bought a couple buildings together in Pennsylvania to start a company called Apex Multifamily, where we're going after larger assets to start syndicating. And are y'all able to see my screen? Okay, that's okay. Um, so tonight I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about lessons learned on my journey and tell you a little bit about my why. I'm gonna see if I can really quickly share my screen. And let me see if you can see it. Can you see it now? Okay. So this is my family. I am married. I've been married almost 20 years. And I have four beautiful kiddos that are 8, 10, just turned 13, and just turned 16. And they are really why I got started in investing in real estate. Um, you know, consistently trying to flip properties and rental income was because I thought I had a baby and I wanted to start uh, figuring out a way that I could be home with him and not not work. And they're really the reason that I keep doing what I'm doing, as I know many of you do as well. So um, a couple of things that I, I just wanted to point out that I think are really critical to success that I've learned on my journey in real estate, and then I'll kind of give you some examples of, of how they have helped me, is um, I believe that grit is really the number one determiner of success in everything that you do whether it's single family, whether it's multifamily, your own businesses, your personal accomplishments. Um, grit is a positive non-cognitive trait, meaning you don't even really have to think about it. You're just doing it based on an individual's perseverance of effort combined with a passion for a particular long-term goal or an end state. So it's a powerful motivation to achieve an objective. And I don't know how many of you might have heard some, some different talks on grit, but there's been a lot of studies by psychologists and sociologists who have tried to figure out what makes people successful and can they determine at a young age who's going to be successful in what they do. And what they found in studying um, valedictorians and salutatorians, the first and second in high school classes, they figured that those kids were the smartest and that they had really good staying power and they must have great studying skills and really be driven and determined in order to be first and second in their class. And what they found oftentimes was those who graduated top of their class did not end up usually being the most successful people. And instead, a lot of times it was kids who did not do very well in school, weren't necessarily the smartest, but it was people who had that just internal fortitude or grit that they were going to do well. They were going to stick with it. They could see a future and a goal, and they were going to do whatever it takes to achieve success. And so there have just been a lot of studies of that. And looking back in my own life, I started really, uh, I was challenged as I was writing a book last year to really look back at my life and what's made me um, resilient. And 
part of it really is that I feel like because of, of some challenges that I had, even starting at a young age, that I just always had that grit to um, suck it up and keep going and do whatever it takes to succeed. And a cousin to grit is resilience. And resilience is the ability to recover quickly from illness, change, or misfortune. It's like buoyancy. And if you think of a buoy, you know, I grew up water skiing and we're going around these buoys and they float on the water. And with the buoy, you can pull it down and it's going to pop back up. And you can pull it down and it's going to pop back up. And so it's kind of that visual of no matter what pulls you down, you have the ability to pop back up and to regain your elasticity. So um, another definition of resilience is a, a property of a material that enables it to resume its original shape after being bent, stretched, compressed, um, or being elastic. And in terms of, of a human character trait, it's a recurrent human need to weather periods of stress and change successfully throughout life. And the ability to weather each period of disruption and um, reintegration leaves us better able to deal with the next challenge. And I think so many of us can probably relate, no matter your, your background or your childhood, but just as women and especially as, as moms trying to juggle so much, there's so many times in lives that things are thrown at us, challenges are thrown at us, and it is easy to, you know, kind of wilt and um, feel like we can't, you know, get ahead. And just being able to really have the mindset that no matter what comes in my day with my family, with my job, with my companies, with my investments, that I am going to not let it break me, but I'm going to figure out how to become stronger and bounce back. I think those two things are the most critical factors for long-term success and long-term joy, no matter what comes in life. And um, so just to give you a little bit of, of my journey through grit and resilience and how I feel like that's really the things that have helped me to get to where I am today and hopefully will lead me you know, into the future, I was challenged, as I mentioned, by um, Kyle Wilson, who is just an amazing person. He has uh, published Chicken Soup for the Entrepreneurial Soul, and he was a business partner with Jim Rohn, who is um, like Tony Robbins' mentor, for those of you that don't know him. And Kyle was publishing a book that he asked me to be a part of on resilience, turning your setback into a comeback, and challenged us to think about um, if we had any stories of resilience. And I hadn't really thought a whole lot about what made me tick and what made me be able to, you know, achieve um, and just con continue to have success. And I really started thinking back to my life and, and what types of things have gotten me to where I am today and the things that I hope motivate any of you that no matter what challenges you're facing or what challenges come, that you can get through it and, and become stronger. So Growing up as a child, my mom and dad divorced when I was really young, and my mother was a single mom of six children. I'm the oldest, and she married three abusive men after um, she and my father divorced, and so I grew up with a lot of responsibility. Um, my mom was a leasing agent in a Section 8 apartment complex, so I grew up in a Section 8 HUD housing complex. Um, lots of things, you know, happened in those complexes that you you fear, you know, are, are going to happen. Um, and you see happening on the news, you know, class C minus probably property, maybe D plus property. And I grew up knowing about um, um, break ins and burglaries and rapes and not murders, but I mean, some pretty bad stuff. And so I always had this kind of sense that I had to protect myself and protect my siblings from the things that happen in our apartment complex and really take care of my siblings because my mom had to work two jobs in order to take care of us um, through a succession of abusive relationships. I've spent the night in battered women's shelters um, multiple times. We've slept in cars. We've had to move in the middle of the night. And so all of those kind of things really shaped me to make me a person that just wanted to achieve and, and excel. And I was really determined that I was going to have a better life for myself. I was going to have to be really smart. I was going to have to achieve and, and be the best at everything that I did. Um, and I also learned never to ever depend on a man to take care of me. And not that that's necessarily the right mindset. Um, I've been married almost 20 years. And I'm very thankful for my husband. 
but I always had that mindset that no matter what, I, I knew I was going to be able to take care of myself and to take care of my kids and to just um, kind of protect and nurture and to keep going um, so that I would be okay. So I had this determination for a better life. I graduated high school early. I graduated college early, working full time and going to school full time. I won employee of the year at, at two, my first two jobs. I won the number one private banker in Texas for Bank of America the first year that I was there. Um, and then I worked at AIG for, for 20 years. And I say all those things just to say that, you know, I've always been that driven overachiever um, uh, in order to be okay and in order to have a, a better future. Um, and so that's where I thought my path in life was going to be. I um, was very driven in the corporate world and that was my, my mindset. I was going to have success. I was going to make money. I was going to have a better life for my family. And then I had a child and I had a preemie and when I was home with my premature baby it just broke my heart to have to think that I was going to have to go back to work and all, all I wanted to do from that point forward was become a mom and be a good mom and a stay-home mom and not have to work and so I went from this very very driven person to just wanting to give my child the best and not have my child be a latchkey kid the way that I was. And I couldn't quit my job because I had just been married a few years and my husband had a six figure uh, school debt like many people do today. And he was just coming out of chiropractic college and we needed my income in order to survive. So I thought in watching HGTV while I was home on maternity leave, all the flip this houses started coming out. This was 16 years ago. And I saw that, wow, I can flip a single house and I can make forty or fifty thousand dollars, maybe a hundred thousand dollars, and all I need to do is flip two houses a year, and I'll be home with my kids, because they make it sound really, really easy. They lie. They don't tell you about holding costs and finance costs and contractors that um, bail on you and overages and budgeting and any of that stuff. And so we decided to flip a house. So we bought our first flip. Um, we did all the wrong things. We financed it traditionally because we didn't know anything about private money or hard money. We went over budget. We went over time. We over improved it. We bought in a terrible location. We bought at a very bad time when we were heading toward a recession. And while that happened, I had a three month old baby when we started and my husband lost his job. So we had a six figure school loan, a car payment, two mortgages, one job, brand new baby. And um, I thought, it was the end of the world. I was never going to be home with my kid and just went through some really, really difficult um, months until that house finally sold. And I told my husband, I just have to get home with my baby. Like that's all I want to do. And if, if these jobs, you know, when you're first out of school as a chiropractor, other chiropractors hire you to basically market for them. And so you're not really seeing patients. You're going to malls and getting people to complete surveys and hope that they'll come to you as a patient. And he just couldn't keep that type of job because he wanted to be a doctor. He didn't want to be a marketing person. And I had this harebrained idea that, honey, if you just start your own business, you can work for yourself and you won't have to worry about being laid off because he had been laid off twice. And we'll just... Um, go into debt to start a business because everybody told us you have to go into debt to start to make money. And we made the big mistake of moving to Pennsylvania, starting a chiropractic business with $700,000 in debt, which included equipment, a building, business startup learns, loans. And I thought and had been promised by all these, you know, chiropractic business coaches that in a year he would make all this money. I could be home with my kids and um, it would be smooth sailing. So we basically became landlords by necessity. It was really a protectionary move, not because I thought, oh, wow, I can be a landlord and, and have cash flowing you know, tenants and become a um, real estate millionaire. So we bought a chiropractic office um, to own instead of leasing space because it was a lot cheaper to buy one that had apartments and garages attached to it. And in my little town, most of the businesses are along Main Street and their businesses on the first floor apartments or a single family home on the, on the second floor. And then some of them have some additional space. So we sold our house. We had a really nice house in Texas that had starting to started to go up in value. 
and um, moved in with my in-laws for a year with a three-year-old baby and a 10-month-old baby and built my husband's chiropractic business. And after a year, we decided that um, we can't really afford to buy a house because my company was only letting me work from home on a trial basis. And so we house hacked again and we bought a four unit apartment building. So we went from big house, two incomes down to living with in-laws and then house hacking a four unit, had three tenants knocking on my door literally every day, every time we stepped outside, every time I got home with my babies. Literally, it sounds, um, sounds like what my grandpa would say, but I was walking up the stairs through the snow with one baby in my hand and one baby you know, in a car seat and just thinking, what in the world have we done with our lives? Um, and just as we were starting to get ahead, the 2008 and 2009 crash happened, and we literally lost almost everything. So I worked for AIG, and AIG is one of the big companies that almost went down in 08 and 09 because they insured most of the mortgages in the country, and they also insured the financials of other companies through a type of insurance called credit default swaps. And AIG was bought, basically lended $2 billion by the U.S government to keep them afloat. I was told we were going to lose our jobs. I lost three quarters of my 401k in a week. And the only thing I knew to do was to get everything else out of my 401k that I could. And so I borrowed what I had left, which was almost $50,000. And I used it to buy another four unit. And I don't know how I got the financing, but I did. And that's basically what we had. So I had been told, you know, weekly, um, our department may be next. We're probably going to lose our jobs. And here we are with $750,000 in debt, um, a job that's probably going to go away, lost all of our retirement funds. And I just didn't know what to do other than, you know, buy another four unit and at least have a, a couple hundred dollars a month per unit coming in. And then within a year, healthcare and chiropractic changed. Uh, we had a significant cut in income. And um, my husband just could barely keep his practice afloat. And so we knew we had to figure something else out. And I thought the answer at that time was large multifamily apartment buildings. So I went to a seminar, a guru coaching program. Back then, there was not many. This was, I think, the only person that was doing multifamily. And this woman, who turned out to be a fraud, put on a seminar on how to buy large apartment buildings and, you know, assured us that if we gave her X thousand of dollars in coaching fees, she would guarantee us that we would buy apartment buildings. She'd help us invest in them and, um, or, or money back. And she offered me a job, which thankfully I didn't take. I told her I'd help her with some things on the side, um, like over Thanksgiving and Christmas. And during that time, because I was in her websites, I discovered that some of the the press releases that she put out or that were out on her, she actually wrote and created the, the um, blogs that looked like they were third party, but they were her own. And so I was just, I discovered she was a fraud or I had a feeling she was a fraud and I confronted her about it. And long story, very short, she tried to destroy our lives. I mean, she lied to my employer and told him I was working for both of them full time, which wasn't true. Um, she demanded money. She had given me a bonus to help her over Christmas um, with something on my vacation, demanded money back the next day, thousands of dollars. Um, and I was just so jaded and so paralyzed at that point and so disheartened. And I just gave up. I gave up on my dream of, you know, maybe buying multifamily apartment buildings. Um, I had learned a lot over about a three or four month period that I was paying her to coach. And I was just at a, a really, really low point thinking, I'm losing my job. I'm in rural Pennsylvania, so I could not have another big six-figure job working for a corporation in this little area. And um, my husband's job you know, company was going to go under. I found out I was pregnant with another child. And it was just like, you know, just a point of kind of hopelessness. And my comeback really after that time, I wasn't as resilient as I now say that we need to be. But over the next few years, I just worked on improving what I could improve. I'm just going to go back here for a second. So I knew that I couldn't buy any more properties because we had not only no money, but we had hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. 
the banks knew I worked for AIG and nobody would give me money. They're like, I was a walking risk for any bank. And I just thought I just am going to have to, you know, figure out, you know, how to find another job and we'll just make these units that we do own better. So we started down the path of, you know, I'd work during the day. I'd go to my husband's practice every day over lunch and handle medical billing and train his staff and learn to, to do that, to keep that afloat. And then in the evenings and weekends, we would update the units that we had. So as people would move out, we would start increasing the values of, of our units, making them nicer, getting higher rents. And then eventually we had a lot of equity in these buildings. And I went for about two or three years to the banks and said, I've got this equity in these buildings. I want to buy another one. And I just heard, no, 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 no. And I just convinced myself that I was never going to be able to borrow against these things for a few more years. And um, the business wasn't getting any better with my husband's business. Um, my job did not lay me off, but we kept being told, you know, you're going to lose your job. So you need to start looking for something. And I didn't know what else to do. And so finally, four, five years ago at this point, after a four year break of buying anything in real estate, because I just didn't think that I could, I um, finally got told by my company that my division was finally being sold. And so we knew like we really were going to lose our jobs and we had made it six years um, without losing our jobs because we happened to handle the, the wealth of the wealthiest clients at our company and they didn't want us to leave, then the clients would leave. And so I decided that I really needed to try to replace my income quickly. And I was going to give it one more go. And I went back, I went to a local meetup group and I knew that I needed to network. I had tried to do everything on my own with my, myself and my husband, but he was running his business and trying to do maintenance on ours. At this point, we had four children. So I had another little surprise angel that I'm very thankful for now. But at the time it was like, how are we going to handle four kids, pay for four kids? I'm losing my job. And you know, it just, it was really hard. And I was so glad that I went back to this, to a, a, a networking event because I met one investor who stood up and said, I've got a three unit and it's in my town, which nobody lives in my town. And he was interested in selling it. And so I just took that opportunity to walk up to him. And afterwards I said, would you consider seller financing? And he said, yeah, I might. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I've read about seller financing, but I've never done it. I better really read up on it. And I asked him to meet me the next day and show me the property. So I stayed up all night reading about how to convince sellers to sell me a property on seller financing. And I met with him and saw his property. And I knew that I could convert it to a four unit. And so all of these time, you know, these books that I had read over the years on investing, I knew how to kind of get creative and, and try to, to make something worth more than what it is currently. And he agreed to sell me this property and I converted it from a three unit to a four unit. And of course, raised the value um, about 25% just by adding another unit. And then the next week I had another older gentleman approach me to sell a property and while he didn't sell it to me, he referred me to someone else. And I bought another four unit of prop property on owner financing. And about a week later, I got a, a message through LinkedIn from a friend of mine in Texas that I hadn't seen in, you know, 10 years, wanting to, I had added something on LinkedIn saying that I was starting to invest in apartment buildings and he wanted to invest with me. And I said, sure, great. If you put in the money, I'll put in the time. And we split everything 50-50 and we bought another four unit. And I felt like, that one decision to put myself out there and to start networking with other people instead of trying to do it all on my own is really what kind of propelled me to the next level of confidence that I can buy properties without a bank and I can figure out how to scale and how to do this. And it gave me the confidence that I could um, start buying and I could just create a five-year plan to build a rental portfolio that would net me $150,000 a year. That's what I needed in rural and PA to basically replace my income and the amount that I would need for health insurance. And so that's what I did as I got started on my five-year plan. And four years later, I reached my goal. So in a nutshell, what I did is I focused on four unit apartment buildings at that time. So while they're not the really large, sexy apartment buildings, it was bigger than a single and a double. So it gave me those economies of scale like the bigger ones do in my area, but they allowed me to buy in a niche where there wasn't as much competition. 
So there weren't a ton of investors looking for four unit apartment buildings. Most of them were going after really big ones or singles and duplexes. And so I was able to kind of have a corner on the market in my area on the four units. And I knew that if I could do it on a four unit, once I got enough of them, I could take that cash and then use it to scale to bigger. And so, you know, four years later, I met my goal, which I needed in order to bring in that 150000 a year to um, buy $5 million worth of rental property across 60 units, and it replaced my six-figure income. And so a year ago, I was at that point, and I knew that I then needed to pay off all of my debt that I had used to rehab these properties, save a year's salary, and save another six months expenses for me to safely retire and feel that I would remain bankable. And so one year later, the final stretch, um, I ended up being so close to retiring and I had a couple of really bad insurance claims happen at the same time. We had a hurricane come through. I lost a roof. We had four basements that flooded and we had a serious mold damage claim that destroyed a three unit apartment building. In fact, it was the building I bought on owner financing four years before. And it all just seemed to come crashing down when I was so close to my goal of retiring. And I was burnt out and didn't think I could go another day. And um, I took six months off from buying anything else, even though I was so close, just to kind of refresh and recharge and um, focus on the portfolio that I did have. I sold the ones I didn't like. Um, and then I found a large apartment building. So, you know, full circle, it took basically nine year, eight and a half years from the time that I was jaded into investing in large apartment buildings. I wish that I had just had the fortitude at that time not to be jaded and to keep looking for people to partner with back then. And I would have been so much further along today, but I'm thankful that I went through what I did because it taught me to, um, learn to do every aspect of investing in rental property on my own. And it taught me how hard it is so that I value so much more really good, strong partnerships with other people that can do it together. And so I bought my first larger complex, a six and a half million dollar, 73 unit building with 44 storage units just last December. And I bought that with two other partners. So we did not syndicate it. We just bought it, the three of us. Um, but the acquisition fee that I got from that allowed me to save a year salary in addition to um, the, you know, the income that I had replaced passively from my rentals and then the additional, you know, asset management fee and the cash flow from rents and the bonus depreciation allowed me to not pay any federal income taxes this year, despite having capital gains from selling properties and making more money last year than I had in a long time. And so I just realized the power in that one deal of, of going bigger and focusing on large multifamily. And this year now I've done another partnership on another 31 unit with my same two JV partners. I now have 70 units in my own portfolio worth about $7 million. Um, a third partnership in uh, two properties, 105 units uh, with my two JV partner, partners. And now I've got a really nice, strong six-figure passive rental income just with my own properties and those that I have JV partnered with that allows me finally the time freedom to be home with my kids, to you know, have a better balance in my life, and to be able to focus on what I'm passionate about and to be able to help other people to do the same. And so I'm just at a place where I finally retired in May. Um, so I've just been really retired for a, for a few months. And now I am doing larger multifamily um, with other partners and, and I'm syndicating my first um, JV, my first deal in Atlanta that's 250 doors right now. And I'm actively pursuing additional large multifamily investments for myself and my partners and just really um, desire to help other people and especially women to realize that it takes a lot of time sometimes and um, it is hard and it's especially hard when you are married and when you have kids or if you're a single mom, but that the time and all of the hurdles and, and all of the things that come along are worth it. That if you just stick with it, um, it may take a lot longer than you think it will, but you truly can develop, you know, true uh, passive wealth 
that, that really lasts, you know, safe, stable properties. And the faster you can get into multifamily and scale with other people, the faster you'll be able to do it. You know, I did it the hard way by starting with the small stuff, but I'm so thankful um, that, that that is what really gave me the expertise and the knowledge and the know-how to be able to be much more valuable today and to be able to scale, you know, much more easily. So um, I would just say, and I know I'm, I'm kind of going over here, I'll wrap this up, but just a couple of things to just encourage y'all through my own story is that, you know, in addition to grit and resilience and, and just sticking with it no matter what comes is, is to truly have a compelling vision and know what you really want in life and not to sacrifice so much today in trying to grow wealth that you forget to make a life today and enjoy your life today. Um, you really want to make sure that you're building your multifamily business in a way that um, is right for you and your own family. There's really no one right way to do it. Um, you know, comparison can be the thief of joy. You know, we look out there and you see all these people doing all these amazing deals and they seem like they have ownership in all of these doors. And, you know, I, I'm all for being partnered in as many doors as you can because it's, it's passive income. But having your own smaller portfolio can also be just as lucrative. And so I think it's really important to have a balance and figure out what's best for you and your own family and how you can leverage your time um, in such a way that you, you have that balance, that you make room for yourself because I didn't make enough room for myself and, and take care of myself well enough while I was trying to take care of everybody else. Um, to create a plan, you know, figure out exactly how much income you need to reach financial freedom and figure out how to build a, a big enough rental portfolio and acquire the properties that's going to best fit your plan to get you to that financial freedom number. So, you know, if your plan is you need X number of dollars to retire and you start chasing, you know, big class A apartment buildings that's not going to pay you much in cash flow, then the, that's misaligned with what your goals are. Um, if you want low stress and you want more time with your family, you certainly don't want to buy class C minus class D properties that are going to take a lot more time and, and be um, a little less stable. And so that would be a, a misalignment of value. So really focus on the type of deals that are going to help you to reach your financial goals um, and your personal goals. And just to be really careful with debt, um, that's any kind of debt other than um, low rate fixed long-term financing. I would say to leverage other people's time and money and figure out what you have more of and, and put in the time for the other. So where you're lacking, partner with other people to fill in the gaps. Where in the beginning, I didn't have time or money. I had really negative both, but I knew I couldn't make more money. Um, I was already working 70, 80 hours a week between my, my business and my job and my husband's business. But I could make time easier than I could make more money. And so I just put in a lot more time. And now I'm at the point where I've got a lot more time and a lot more money so I can, you know, be more helpful to other people that are, are lacking in that area. And your network is your net worth. Um, so really utilize meetups, these masterminds where we can really help one another. And, um, you know, I encourage all of you, I'm here for you guys. If there's anything that I can do for y'all, you know, you're, welcome to reach out and I'm happy to, to lend advice or help you look at deals or figure out creative ways to finance. Um, but just to, to utilize and leverage your network to stay creative. Um, instead of saying, I can't find deals, I can't get money. Like I said, you know, five years ago, the banks won't give me money. I, I don't have a way to scale is really challenge yourself to always get creative and think outside the box and think, how can I find more deals? How can I make something a deal that maybe other people don't see as a deal? And how can I find more money, increase my credit, find more deals without money, um, find multiple entrance strategies, multiple exit strategies, multiple finance strategies that help you just to continue to be able to grow um, despite what other people are doing or what they, what they say isn't possible. I'd say also be good to people. Um, look to be a blessing to everybody you interact with and look to create win-win deals. So when you're um, looking all for yourself, and I, I used to have the mindset of, I don't want to partner anymore because I'm giving up that cash flow and I need it. I've learned to 
um, be a better partner and to um, that you really can grow further when you grow together and sometimes faster when you grow together um, and just to be really good to other people. And then your mindset is critical. So I would just say, believe that you can um, celebrate your unique abilities and what makes you unique um, and an asset to other people um, to celebrate your small wins. Because I know for myself, I didn't usually stop and smell the roses and just um, celebrate what I had been able to accomplish. And really, it wasn't until I wrote my, my chapter in the book um, back in August that I really even went, wow, you know what, Anna, you've done a really good job through a lot of insurmountable odds. And I never really took t time to appreciate what I had been able to accomplish. And so, you know, there's a balance in, in pride and humility. And we don't want to be, you know, super prideful because that comes before the fall. But sometimes we can be um, self-deprecating and, and not um, realize how valuable we really are. And we need to take time to, to have faith in ourselves, to challenge ourselves, to keep going, um, knowing that if we just keep it up, we will reap the harvest. Um, I would say, I'm wrapping up here, but to do everything with integrity, um, always doing the right thing when nobody's looking is the most important thing. And if we can't be trusted with small things, then we can't be trusted with bigger things. Um, just like the woman who ended up defrauding all of these people, including myself, and, you know, really um, made many people's lives miserable, she ended up finally going to prison um, for several years. So your sins always find you out. And I think it's really, really important to never do a great deal with a bad guy or a bad woman, <laughs> a bad person. So, you know, if you have any inkling that somebody doesn't have integrity, especially in this business that's a team sport, it's better to give up the cash flow, give up the big deal, give up, you know, whatever clout you think you have by participating in it and know every single person that you're involved in that deal with and make sure that they are people that have the utmost integrity because you can go down with them even if you mean well and even if you don't know what they're doing. Um, and then to take, learn to take calculated risks. So study the economy, know the good and the bad, know that you cannot control everything and to not quit your day job without a strong backup plan. Um, we weathered the storms of 2007 and eight and nine and they almost destroyed us. And we thought we had everything figured out. We thought we mitigated every risk. And the reality is nobody could have ever anticipated the type of economic collapse that we had. And we made a lot of decisions in, in hindsight, like taking on three quarters of a million dollar debt to start a business that were really unwise. And so I think especially in this point in the market cycle and this point in the economy when we're most likely headed toward a recession, I would just challenge y'all to be really um, conservative and think more about preservation than taking you know, aggressive risks um, with the types of properties that you're buying, um, the types of areas that you're buying in. And just really um, use this time to become a market expert and to, to learn and study the economy and how changes could impact you as an investor and your family. And then um, just to stay persistent. And then I'll leave you with this, my life motto in life and in business that I think um, is really what carries me through and everything that I try to base um, my investing on and the type of person that I am is just to love God, love people, use money and never, ever, ever give up. So I encourage y'all to do that. I hope that um, my journey has been somewhat of an inspiration to you and an encouragement to y'all to just continue to, um, to persist and to grow and um, hope that that's been valuable. Thank you, Anna. That was great. I really enjoyed hearing more about your story and several of the points you made hit really close to home for me. So I think I needed to hear some of that and I appreciate it. Um, Thank you. We'll go ahead and start questions. I'll, I have one, so I guess I'll go first since I'm already talking. You were talking at the end about the upcoming recession, and I know I saw you post on Facebook last week some tips and points for you know how to prepare for that. I wanted to hear your thoughts on, uh, you, you know, you hear people say don't over leverage, which I agree, but what are your thoughts on less leverage or more reserves, and which one would you say you focus more on? So I have have been through living proof that the borrower is slave to the lender. It's an old proverb 
but it, it's true. The more debt that we have, the more risk that we take on. With that said, I think there's different types of debt. So you've got consumer debt and you've got, you know, what's considered debt that pays, you know, for your assets that end up, um, you know, your, your, your debt like mortgage debt that's paying for cash flowing assets. I think as long as you're going after low rate, long term fixed debt, it's still a very wise thing to do when you're buying cash flowing assets. We are in a, in a point in the mar, a point in the economy where we are historically the lowest of the lowest rates. Um, and I don't think that they're going to stay super, super low forever, but that means that our investments are going to do better because of the fact that we are able to leverage so cheaply today. And I've done a lot of different studies and, and researched um, other experts who have studied leverage and basically, as long as you can borrow up to 80% for cash flowing residential real estate properties. And when I say residential, I don't mean like um, four unit below versus commercial five plus. What I mean is residential, like multifamily where people are living. As long as you're buying cash flowing assets and you have leverage at below six to 7%, typically you're going to do better than if you were to buy, you know, with less leverage or cash. And so right now, as long as rates remain below 6%, I'm very, very comfortable taking on millions of debt dollars in debt. And I've, I've signed on, you know, multiple non-recourse loans that are millions of dollars in debt. And they're not truly non-recourse because they've got the bad boy carve outs. Um, but it's, it's the best kind of debt that you can have as long as it's fixed. So what I'm not real comfortable with personally is bridge debt financing right now. So just for me personally, because of where I am and how much I've almost lost during bad times, I really like um, debt that's fixed. So I'd rather go after today assets where I'm going to preserve some capital and maybe not make quite as much cash because there's not as much upside in the big heavy value add. Um, until we come out of a recession period. So for example, um, I could go in and I could buy a class C property that might be, uh, there's my puppy, that might be, you know, 40% vacant and have to take on bridge financing that I hope I can get out of in two years. Well, if we're going toward a recession and the banks start pulling back and I can't refinance that thing, I'm going to be hurting, my investors are going to be hurting, and we're not going to be able to execute that business plan. So rather than take on that level of risk, I'd rather buy in a class A or B area, a building that doesn't need quite as much value add where I can get low rate fixed financing and a few years of interest only. Um, and then if the economy turns and you know I can't sell the building for what I want to, or I can't execute my plan as quickly as I want to, then I can still keep that property you know, for 10 years. My investors will stay in it a little bit longer, even if I can't refi it. And I'm not going to be stuck in a situation where I can't refi. Um, so personally, I would say I love leverage for buying multifamily, especially while rates are low. But I think that you're wise to um, focus on preservation and long-term fixed financing rather than the big heavy at, heavy lifts um, that that have some uncertainty in in whether you can accomplish your goals if we hit a recession and whether you can refi. Makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If anybody else has questions, you can just unmute yourself and ask. I have a question, Anna. What you Hi. mentioned that uh, 250 unit in, that you just acquired in Atlanta that you're syndicating yourself. How how do you go about finding? Um, my struggle is, you know, I get a lot of uh, deals in, in my inbox from brokers around the country, and I. You know, I I try to filter them, and then I pick some. I I I, I end up with a uh, some, and I it just they're never deals. They never work. So how how do how what's a, what's a deal to you? And like this 250 in Atlanta. Why why did you buy that one? What what made that a deal for you? So this particular deal is is a little out of my my historic box and what I've done. So I told you I've done mostly deals here in central Pennsylvania. Um, I've sourced three off-market bigger deals. The two that I JV'd with came to me off-market. 
And so I really feel just blessed that I even came across them, to be honest with you. So my challenge there was I needed $3 million and I had to find invest, you know, a couple investors that would fund it. So it gave me you know, the confidence to be able to raise money, but I hadn't done a syndication and I hadn't found properties out of state. So I've been looking for properties out of state since last August. And I've only found like two or three that penciled to my level of what I would consider a deal. And I lost the bid because they went for crazy dollar amounts, um, like many of you guys are seeing as well. So I had not been successful in finding anything out of state that I um, was interested in investing in that penciled that made sense to me. And I had somebody else approach me and ask me if I would help with this particular deal in Atlanta. So they found the deal and knew that I had asset management experience and that I have been basically through, you know, a complete life so- cycle of, of deals from everything from, you know, finding due diligence, financing, agency debt, you know, selling, refining and whatnot. So they brought me in to help with due diligence, asset management, and the capital raise. So this is my first syndication and really someone approached me to partner with them. It's not that I found the deal. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's my struggle, finding a deal yeah. that pencils. Um, right. And I, I, I put in LOIs, but nothing. They, I, I haven't been accepted for anything because I'm not willing to pay that top dollar. Right. And I'm I think not, I'm not willing to be the greater fool. Right, right. And that's really important, you know, at this point in the market cycle, and Ashley could probably speak to this too, because you're seeing, you know, a lot of different deals. But at this point in the market cycle, the numbers are so crazy that unless you find an off market deal, it's hard to make them pencil um, once they're listed. I did um, go through a property that I had high hopes for, you know, last week on on Thursday, I met with a seller, it hadn't been listed, it was a pre marketed deal. And there were just two of us that knew about it. Um, We didn't get the deal because the first guy that the seller called, he had been hounding him for seven years to sell him these properties, and he had given him his word that he'd call him first. So he called him first, the guy took it down. And if he can't close, it's going to come back to us and we'll find it. But those were like through, through relationships with brokers um, that happened to just bring us something before it hit the market. And, you know, it could still come back to us, but I'm finding that the, those, those close relationships where you're investing are critical. And I get lots of things that come to me that say they're off market. And then you find out that they've, you know, come to you off market from three different sources and they've been sourced you know, for months and months at at different price points, and they're just not really off market deals. And so I think just continuing to pound the pavement where you really want to invest, like it's very tempting for me, I really want to invest in Texas, because I believe in Texas, and I like Atlanta, and I like, you know, Raleigh and parts of Florida. I'm not the boots on the ground there. So the brokers don't give me the time of day, no matter how many times I call them and bug them and say, do you have any deals? Because I'm not there. I don't have the relationships in the network. And so I'm learning, you know, for the stuff that's here, I'm, I'm getting a lot of success in word of mouth off market referrals to me. And I'm mailing, you know, I'm trying to get strategic and, and my one JV partner and I, we're now mailing um, and, and finding creative ways to get owners of big properties to actually open our mail um, to try to take down off market deals. And for the stuff that's outside of, you know, my immediate area, I think the really only way to, to really find good deals is to start partnering with other people who really are boots on the ground there and that have some experience and then to kind of leverage what you bring and what they're good at so that you can work together and create a win-win deal, you know, whether you're the one sourcing it or doing the DD or doing the asset management, um, construction management like Ashley's been doing. And so um, I think in this type of environment, especially it's all about relationships and you're just not going to find those deals unless you've built relationships to get off market pocket listings or partnering with other people that are really good at doing that themselves. Yeah. Thank you. I got to work on those relationships. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up. Did Opal, did you have a question? She's muted. 
Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking for a second to unmute myself. I don't think that noise is my end. I don't know if I heard it. Can you hear me? I'm not sure what that is. Opal, I think we have an issue with your sound. It's uh, making a strange noise. You want to put your question in the chat box, maybe? Hi. Uh, while while um, um, she's uh, typing, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so I been um, I have I been uh, putting money for these three investment. Uh, no, actually two uh, two investment already. So one as a GP and one as a LP. Um, and um, the the deal operator uh, is offer another um, investment and all in Texas. Um, so what is your thought if I'm putting all my um, investment? So I'm not sure it's going to be LP or GP again this time um, in one uh, deal operator. Am, am I putting my eggs in one basket? It's really hard to say without knowing more, you know, about you and your finances. I'm, I'm very big on diversification um, just in general. I, you know, started out my um, career in private banking and securities licenses and learning about stocks, funds, and mutual funds. And the three things that they really tell you are um, diversification, 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 yeah. and make sure that you are investing in things that are um, in basically three buckets. One is your bucket for cash flow. One is your bucket for growth. And one is your belt bucket for wealth preservation. And so as long as you've got investments that help you preserve cash, some that pr that produce income, and some that will appreciate. That gives you diversification to some extent, but then you got to figure out what type of asset classes can you be invested in, and then, and then where. And so for me, I just, even though I've been trained on it and it's been ingrained in me, I don't believe in the stock market. I don't invest in the stock market. I think it's purely speculative because you have no control of what those companies are actually worth and what they do and the debt that they have. And so I am all in real estate. I am only, I, I'm, I'm invested in some currencies and things like that, but for the most part, I'm all in real estate. The way I personally diversify is I, I diversify by investing my retirement funds with different operators and in different locations. So I personally wouldn't put all of my eggs in one operator because if that, if something goes down with that operator, then you've lost everything. So I, you know, at AIG, I had almost all of my retirement account in AIG stock and I almost lost it all. Um, so I, you know, I think that it's wiser to spread your money across different operators and in different locations. I see. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, let me see if Opal asked her question. It says, I find that off-market deals always aren't the best as you end up overpaying. Isn't it best to buy something off the MLS? I don't think that's necessarily true. I think, I think like anything, you know, I've heard don't use LoopNet. It's like the graveyard of multifamily deals. But I've actually bought stuff off of LoopNet that's turned out to be really good because I've been able to see something that other people haven't been able to see. And so there are different deals that are going to be come to you through different avenues. And I think part of it depends on how big the asset is and where the assets located. Um, again, I'm just getting into the much bigger deals. So I've focused on smaller deals for a long time, but I found deals um, off, off market. The smaller the deal is when you're dealing with less than let's say a hundred units. And I'm just using that number kind of arbitrary, but Oftentimes, like the off-market units, off market 73 unit I found, it was um, a second-generation apartment complex. So the gentleman I bought it from was in his 70s. His father, who built them, was in his 90s. And even though they were wealthy, they weren't sophisticated when it came to multifamily and really knowing exactly what that building could have sold for. They operated it at below market rents. They operated it not efficiently, so they had really high water costs and really high electrical costs and 
they just weren't super sophisticated. They just, just had passive income. They didn't have mortgage on the property anymore. And so they were content with leaving the rents where they were. And if they had listed that with a broker, they would have, you know, used pro formas and people would have flocked to that deal because it looked so good on paper. But because they really weren't that sophisticated, even though they had money, it was much easier for me to come in and say, listen, Mr. Seller, based on your, you know, net operating income, here's what it's worth. I'll give you a little extra if you'll give me the opportunity to buy it. And so sometimes it's easier to negotiate on properties that are not yet at that institutional size because you just have sellers who aren't quite sophisticated enough to know what they really have and what they could sell. Once it's listed and it's a large multifamily, at least what I'm seeing is they're getting top dollar because of where we are in the cycle. I don't know if anybody wants to nod yes or not no and disagree, but um, I think once they're listed and they're, they're large multifamily, they're going to go for top dollar, at least today. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Anna. Sure. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. Good to see you. Likewise. Thanks. So I've been hearing a lot about exactly what you're saying. Um, people like really paying a lot, way more than, you know, like Rod's uh, Warriors group is taught just to be very sophisticated and to stress test it on different angles. Mm -hmm. um, I even under, at yesterday's meetup, Mandy and I did underwriting on a deal. She just got in her inbox and we just kind of like did it on the spot. And um, we, we knew that we probably would pay like 6.4 million, but someone might pay 8 million for it, right? And so I'm thinking ahead, I'm thinking, okay, so the recession's gonna come. Are these people that are gonna be underwater at that point, do you feel? Are they, are they gonna be in a stressful situation that they're gonna have to get rid of it? Um, is that even part of the market? Because I do residential, so you have like short sales, for example. So what happens when yeah. you have a family that you bought at 8 million and it's, not performing at 8 million and you're in a bad situation. Sure. I, I think there's a couple of different things. I think the institutional investors, while to us it looks like they're overpaying, compared to what their options are in the stock market today, they see, at, they see these properties as a source of preservation, not as a source of cash flow. And so those that are going after like the class A, class B assets, um, Oftentimes they want assets that are fully performing. They don't want something that they're going to have to go in and do a lot of value add. So those nice property areas, they're content to pay a four cap or a five cap because they know that they can put their investors cash there or they can put their company's cash there and that those assets generally will weather economic storms and that they can be patient and hold them through a recession and come back on the upside. So they're sophisticated enough that they know that that asset could go down in value somewhat, but it's not going to go down a lot just because of they're, they're also buying in major markets where there is a lot more um, demand than there is supply, where there's a very diverse economy and there's lots of employers and, and where they have above average income earners living in those properties. So they kind of mitigate their risk of recession in that way. So I think for those investors, even though they're really overpaying by our standards. They know what they're doing and, and they're buying multifamily real estate because it's, it's smart and it's fairly resilient to a recession more so than the stock market. Um, then you've got investors like us and the people that you see, you know, putting together deals that are, that are trying to partner and, and just get started. And I, I do fear that a lot of people who are generally, let's say it's four or five partners and four are new and they just went through a well-known boot camp and they're new and they're evaluating deals. They get this um, shiny gold object syndrome and they think, oh, we can take it down because we have passive investors that want to get started in multifamily and they're willing to fund the deal and they take a little more risk, they overpay. And, and I do think that when a recession happens, if they weren't conservative in their underwriting, and they don't get those 3% annual increases and their vacancy rate, you know, goes to 10 instead of to five or um, their economic vacancy is high because they bought in a class C tertiary market, hoping that they could um, do as well as the primary market or the secondary market did when the recession hits and those people can't afford to pay rent 
and they're not in a big enough market where there's a lot of employment drivers um, and there's layoffs, those, those people are going to really be hurting and their investors are going to be hurting because they're basically creating a business plan in a market that's not strong in an economy that's not diverse enough to keep people employed and in a um, economic class of people that typically can't afford to pay top dollar just because they get granite countertops and nice paint and nice, nice flooring. And so I think a lot of people that are getting into the space now who don't have experience either as business people or a financial background to understand the economy and markets are really going to be hurting by, by overpaying and not really thinking about the consequences and the strength of their business plan based on where they're buying and what they're buying. So it makes me very nervous, you know, to, to see some of these deals. And now that I'm retired and I have all my, my, you know, retirement funds that I can invest, I'm investing in other people's deals passively. And a lot of the stuff that's come to me, I'm like, I just cannot believe the level of risk these people are taking. But people just want to be in multifamily so badly and they want to invest passively so badly that they really aren't thinking about, you know, what if these numbers don't pan out. And so I, I just think you have to be really careful in what you buy and to be patient. You know, that's the thing that I've learned with, with deals is, don't do a deal just to do a deal. You know, this is not a, a sprint. And when we feel like I have to do a deal, I have to take down something, we can make really stupid decisions on what we buy um, just so that we can get yield. You know, oh, this one's going to be a, a nine cap. Well, is it really? You know, how strong is that market and that business plan where I'd rather make a, a seven cap deal and be in a stable market, uh, a stable operator that has some experience or at least a couple of people on the team um, and, and an uh, above average income level to know that I'm going to have stability in that business plan no matter what happens. Nice. Thank you. That was really helpful. You're welcome. I think Ashley had a question for you, Anna, in the chat box. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Ashley says, what's your thought on almost every market cycle being at the top of the cycle and buying at the height of the market? In other words, even if you aren't overpaying, you're paying top dollar in most markets, minus Houston and Little Rock. If they survive through the oversupply recession periods, how long do you think it'll take to rebound to make it to the price point in which it was purchased? Variability between markets. You know, I've, I've thought about that if I'm, if I'm, reading your question properly, is from, from the little research that I've done, I've just started really studying markets and like what happened in the last recession. Um, we're in the longest expansion period since truly President Abraham Lincoln was in office. So we've gone longer in this up cycle than we have at any other time. And so there's not a whole lot of markets to really compare, a whole lot of previous recessions to compare what might happen in the future. I think the last recession, it took a long time to come out of, but it was such a, um, a perfect storm of economic drivers that caused that recession between the um, mortgage markets, between overbuilding and oversupply, um, all of the financial crisis, those financial companies that, that crashed and how intertwined the um, financial system was so that when one company went down, the other companies all had so much stock in those companies that then they started to go down and, and we had liquidity issues. So I think we can't really necessarily look at the last recession and say, how long did it take those prices to level out and those cap rates to get back to, to normalcy? Because I think that recession was so bad, hopefully it's not going to be that bad again. Um, if you go back even further, you're like 20 years back. And so, you know, that recession wasn't as bad. But what I, what I have been seeing is that in the, the few people that have put out some research on, on trying to figure out what that cap rate spread's going to be, which I think is kind of what you're asking, um, it's been about a 1% spread over like a 10-year period in cap rate values. So I've just kind of said, okay, if I'm going to buy something today, let me assume that if I weather a recession and I hold it 10 years, that it's my cap rate's not going to be as good even 10 years from now. And it might be a percent lower um, than 
than, or I'm sorry, a percent higher than what it is today. So if I bought today at a six cap at the top of the market over a 10 year period from other cycles, it looks like maybe we'll be at a seven cap, you know, 10 years from now. So I think that's where it becomes really important only to buy stuff that has enough value add that even if the cap rate goes up, um, you've got enough room in the rent growth that even in a recession, you're still going to make rents higher than what they are today because of um, just because of how low those market rents are. So I think you've got to be in an area where there is um, more demand than there is supply is one of the factors. And then where you're buying a property that's below market rent. So I think areas like Houston, Houston's a little behind the cycle because of the major hurricane. So they're still kind of like on recovery or a lot of other areas are in hyper supply. So I think if you can buy assets that are in markets like Houston that are in recovery, even if it seems like you're overpaying, there's still upside because if there's not, they're not in oversupply. Maybe there's upside there a little longer than upside in some of the areas that are like in hyper supply that are going to head toward a recession right away. And that's why I've been trying to find assets in Houston but I still haven't found any that really make sense that aren't a significant value add. So I'm definitely not an expert economist in any way, but I just see that um, we should anticipate that if a recession happens, we might not get back to this price point for, you know, 10, 12, 15 years. And even if we do, the cap rates might still be, you know, higher than what they are today. So I'm just trying to be super conservative in my numbers and find markets where they're, um, is definitely more more demand than their supply, and hope that that helps those markets weather a financial storm or a recession. Did that answer the question? Okay. I just wanted to point out something. The latest CBRE report on uh, cap market cap rates across the country just came out, and I was looking at it, and for the first time, I am seeing. Uh, uh, cities in this country and very in various look various areas of the country where the cap rates have for the first time that I've not that since I've been watching it the cap rates have gone up and one of those is San Antonio Texas for example mm -hmm. so. and it, it's it's so interesting because I'm again I'm I'm newer to the larger multifamily stuff I just have a good background in um, investments in general and, and stock market changes and recessions and, and expansion periods. So that helps me in, in starting to evaluate the multifamily thing. But I think that the key is no matter where it is, look at where employment is going. So like Atlanta, for example, there are more Fortune 500 companies moving into Atlanta, Georgia now than almost anywhere else. And certain parts of Texas, people are just moving there in droves. And so when you see that um, big employers are, are starting to move into certain areas and they are conservative politically um, because that allows property taxes to be lower and businesses to want to come in because they get tax deductions for doing that, I say those areas are going to weather any kind of economic storm better than anywhere else. So even though San Antonio, like the cap rates are changing because people have been overpaying there's still a lot of employers that want that are like moving into that area and a lot of people. Um, so I'm still, I'm really bullish on, on cities where there's a lot of new employers coming in and where most people are moving to because they're moving there for a reason. So that means that your, your economic diversity and your employer base is going to be strong. Even in a recession, if you lose a few, you've still got so many others that are making up a smaller percentage of the total employment there. So I think areas like Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, um, Phoenix, Orlando, where there's just so much population and job growth, those areas are going, they're just going to do better. So the question now becomes, how do I find a deal there without overpaying? Um, there's a lot less supply than there is demand. Um, and there's a lot of, um, most of the new builds are, you know, class A. So if you can find a class A to B area and find a class C property that maybe the hedge funds don't want because they're too dirty and ugly, then you can take a little more risk with the asset being older. Um, but you're not going to be hurt by the local economy hurting, you know? So I just feel like, 
I don't know which markets are going to do really well and which aren't. But if it's an area where employers are coming and people want to live and they've got great schools, then they're going to be more resilient. So now it's just a matter of finding deals there instead of chasing deals in areas of the country that we know have had a huge increase in value since the last recession and where people got hurt really bad in the last recession. Do we have any other questions? We might have time for one more and then we probably need to wrap um, it up. I think I have a question for Anna. Okay. Sure. Hi, Anna. This is Chat. Um, Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, so I uh, got into this multifamily investing um, because um, my portfolio consisted of mostly the stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. So right now I could literally buy a building on my own, but I, I'm, I'm, I don't plan to syndicate at my age. It's 50, 59. I do not want to be um, taking that um, load. So what I've been doing is I've been investing in uh, passively, um, you know, and so therefore, because I wanted to make sure that my investment is, is safe, quote unquote safe, there's really no safe um, right. investment nowadays. Um, I really study a deal. I'm really studying the business as if I'm syndicating, even though I don't have plans. Now, my question to you is, um, you be having been into the multifamily and also having been a financial advisor, I um, do, would you advise somebody who is in the multifamily? I'm looking, I'm looking, looking, looking for deals right now, but there are, there's not just a deal that it's very nerve wracking that there, the deals that come to me are really not, um, you know, as great. So would you, Tell somebody like me to take out the money from the stocks and bonds and park it somewhere while looking for my, um, here's what I think. And I'll caveat this with, I am no longer licensed. I gave up my security license cause I knew I never wanted to be back in, in, um, in securities. And quite frankly, there's just a lot of regulation, like whoever you're parked with, they need to know everything you invest in. And so I'll caveat this with, I don't want this to be really personal financial advice. And I would check with your advisor what I tell you. <laughs> but with that said, here, here is how I look at investing overall. I want to invest in things that I know I have as much control of and understanding of as possible as a passive investor. So the deals that I have in my own portfolio, the reason I love them is because I have total control of those deals. I have total control of what I pay, how much money I get, how they're operated, and what I can sell them for within reason. Um, when you're dealing with the stock market in general chat, you are, tr you are really speculating. You're hoping that you're investing in companies that are gonna do well. But nine times out of 10 when I talk to people, they really have no idea what that company is worth that they're investing in. And so what happens is the stock market, the price is really, it should be core, the market price that people pay for that stock today should be correlated with the value of that company and what it's really worth. But the reality is as limited partners, which is what you basically are in, in stock investing, you're, you're buying equity, but you really don't have any control of that company. We're not educated enough on, on valuations of companies to understand what their price per earnings ratios are and what their debt do, looks like and what their business plans are, how well they're executing that business plan because we don't see that in publicly, publicly um, available information. And so we're completely putting our trust in our stockbroker or our advisor to know and understand what those companies are really worth. And we're basically putting our investments in completely other people's hands without really being able to understand it. And so what happens is people buy stocks based on a feeling of whether they like that company. You know, Facebook rolls out, Uber rolls out, um, these types of companies and these IPOs go crazy and people buy them at crazy dollar amounts when they have no idea what they're about. 
They buy Bitcoin when I bought some Bitcoin and you really, it's total speculation. So what, what's happened with the stock market where we are today and really where we've been over the last several years is that the market value is so much higher than what the true intrinsic value of that company is across the stock market, across the S&P in many, many cases. And so people much smarter than I am who are looking at these companies and their actual valuation are saying, we have to have a correction because the market price and the demand for these companies is so out of whack from what they're really worth. And if anything happens in the economy that makes them not be able to refinance debt or be able to you know, meet their gross you know, income targets, then those companies can become unstable. And what's going to happen is people will get skittish when they realize that these earnings reports missed the mark or they didn't make as much or they had a big loss that, that month or that quarter. And then the market price just tanks because people lose consumer confidence. So the value of your investment is really based on consumer confidence. And when you hit a recession and the market starts to crash, everyone's going to panic. They're going to pull their money out. They're going to sell. The value of that stock goes down and you've instantly lost whatever paper value you thought you had because the company was never really worth what you paid. And so I just don't like the whole concept of investing in something that I really don't understand and that I have no control of. When I deal with multifamily investments or self-storage or anything that's commercial real estate, even though you don't really have control of the cap rate, you can make an educated enough decision on a long-term hold to say, okay, we're, we're down here in, in recovery. So the chances are this area like Houston, it's going to go up in value for a couple of years and it's maybe more resilient economically in a recession. Or you can say, wow, we're way up here. People are way overpaying. I'm not going to pay overpay because then I'm doing nothing different than I would do buying stocks in a frenzy. And instead, I'm going to be patient and I'm going to invest in things that um, maybe aren't worth this today or may maybe the cap rate's going to go up and the value's going to come down if I did nothing to the property. But I know I can make money a different way. I can control what I can make that net operating income. So while I can't control the cap rate, I can assume that if history you know, repeats itself, let's say that cap rate's going to go up a percent like we were talking about with Ashley, but can I raise the value? Can I raise those rents $200 a month? And, and say I raise them 200 today and then I take a 10% dip in my, um, in my occupancy rate. As long as I'm buying that property right in the right area, I still control what I make the rent to some extent. I still control how much I can cut those expenses. And therefore, I'm, ba I'm able to kind of mitigate the risk of the cap rate changing. So I still have much more understanding of the true value of that asset and what it's probably going to look at like in an up and down cycle. So I just have much more knowledge and control to make a better investment decision than I ever would investing in stocks. So I am all in real estate. Like my, my 401k since I've, um, since I've retired, I am invested in apartment buildings. I'm invested in notes and I'm investing in self-storage because I understand the fundamentals of those things. And I know that as much as I can have control as a limited partner, I control my knowledge and my understanding of the asset. And I'm investing with operators that I know have been through cycles and that understand how to raise values and cut expenses, regardless of what happens with the cap rate. So personally, what I tell people is like the people really close to me, my friends, you know, the, I, the deal I'm syndicating for now said, you don't have to invest with me but I want you to understand you keeping your money in the stock market is hoping and praying um, for you know, it not to go too bad, but you have zero confidence that you have any control. So I say we are heading to a recession. Every economist in the, you know, just about every economist say it's a matter of when, not if, because we know where we are in the cycle. We know what's happening with the yield curve. It's just a matter of when. So, personally, I pulled my money out of the, the market in my 401k 18 months ago, because that's just how conservative I am. I started seeing some indicators and I thought, I'm going to put however much I can get matched by my, my company. And then I have it in money market. So I decided this isn't a time to get greedy and put my money at risk. I'm just going to take the 150% match that my company made and keep it in a money market. 
So what I'm telling people now is, is if, if I were anybody and I had money in the stock market today, this isn't the time to focus on growth. It's the time to preserve and to make sure that um, you're not going to lose because the market is going to correct. It's just a matter of when. So if you can look at the market and maybe watch like CNBC and see where the S&P is on a given day at like 3 p.m., like an hour before the stock market closes, if it's an up day and it's starting to rally, pick that day and sell 5 to 10% of your stocks and just park them in a money market account and do it over and over and over when we, we're on up days so that you can hope to start selling in the top before it crashes. And then invest your money temporarily in a money market fund until you find the right multifamily investment or, um, you know, look at there's, there's note funds right now that I've got some of my money that pay 8% on a one year lockout and with a hedge fund that's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, if I trust the company and I know what they've done with notes over 20 years, um, I'm happy to make 8% and, and give up the chance that I could make another 20 or I could lose it all. So I think you just really have to evaluate, is it worth it to have any of my money that I'm depending on living on in, especially at 59, um, you know, you're in your retiring years, you don't want to lose it all now. And the chances are in the next, you know, 18 months, it'll start to tank. And then it'll probably stay low for a couple of years. So I just think it's wiser to sell as you can to stay liquid. And then you've also got cash for when, when, uh, cap rates go up and properties start coming down, the people that overpaid and start to get hurt, you'll have cash to be able to capitalize on buying some of those things. So that's just my Thank free, you. hopefully okay advice, but I would talk to your advisor too. Thank you so hopefully much. Hopefully that wasn't too long-winded. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. I just want to know how is Chuck 59 years old? That, I know. That doesn't pencil out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I feel look okay. amazing. You have no <laughs> idea the aches and pains. I try. I, I, <laughs> I have the aches and pains I have. <laughs> yeah. but, um, thank you. Does so anyone much. else have any more questions for me? Okay. I think that's it. Well, thank you all so much again for having me. Thank you so much for your willingness to be here. We really Thank enjoyed it. Thank you so it. much for your time. You're so welcome. So good to see you, ladies. So before y'all go, uh, I just want to say, if any of you have suggestions for like future topics that you want us to cover, if you can contact me or Chad or Michelle, that way we can, you know, put it on the books and get something rolling for you. And then also, if you have any future guests that you want to see us bring on, and they can be men, by the way, they do not have to be women. Definitely contact us about that as well. Uh, and then the other thing was our next Zoom call will be the 18th of September, same time, 8 p.m. Central. So put it on your calendars and I hope to see you all there. Y'all have a good night. Thank Thanks, you. ladies. Have Bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye.